To those of you that are watching online and those that are here in person, thank you for joining us today. Happy Father's Day! Thank you, ladies. It is Father's Day, and Happy Father's Day to you, too. If you are a dad, we have a couple drawings for some amazing gift cards here, and we want to give out to some winners, okay? So I need you, if you are in person in a service, I need you to go out to the lobby sometime before or after service and just write out your name, put it in the box in the lobby. If you are watching online, I just need you to write out your full name in the chat with the hashtag dad. At two o'clock. Be watching Facebook where I will do a live video of drawing the winners. But in my opinion, you dads are all winners. <laughs> Girls, how can we give today? You can give online. You can drop it in the lobby box. You can meal to the church. Here, Here comes the service. Okay. Good morning. Happy Father's Day. It is great to see all of you here. Everybody doing okay today? Yes? Okay. All right. I, I, thank you for joining us online. Uh, we are so excited to be able to worship together and experience God's presence. So let's start today with a word of prayer. Uh, Father, we are so grateful for your love for us and your kindness toward us, towards us. God, I pray that today in our service that you would speak to us, that you would challenge us. God, as we take a few moments here to worship you and to lift you up, God, would you help us, God, to connect with your heart and experience your presence in a powerful way. Lord, as we look at your word, challenge us, change us, and ultimately make us more like you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you are at home, uh, please worship with us. And if you're here, if you don't mind standing, let's stand, let's worship, and let's uh, celebrate what God has done for us. Greater is the one who's in us. Greater is the one who calls our name. He will never fail. For your love 
where we are, that you are fighting for us even now. We praise you. We glorify you, God. Be glorified, God. I count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out, working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I Sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me. Won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will put you high. joy when my heart is heavy all my days oh yes i will for all for all my days oh yes i will i choose to praise to glorify Glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. All my days, oh yes, 
the living God, Spirit of the living God. We only want to hear your voice. We're hanging on every word. Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God. We want to know you more and more. We're hanging on every word. Because when you speak, do what only you can do. It changes us. It changes what we see and what we seek. And when you come in the room, or when you do what only you can do, it changes us. It changes what we see and what worship team for leading us. If you want to take a seat, thank you so much for being here today and for joining us online. Again, I just want to say happy Father's Day. 
uh, to all the dads out there. Uh, thank you for all you do. And uh, to express our appreciation to you, if you weren't here uh, either tuning in online or if you weren't in the room when the pre-service show went on, uh, we are doing a drawing like we normally do. We're going to be asking you, if you're on the live stream, to type your name, your full name, and then hashtag dad in the chat to enter that drawing. And then if you're here, um, maybe not right now, but at the end of service, if you go out to the foyer, there's a place where you can write your name down and drop that in. And then at 2 o'clock, Pastor Kermit is going to do that drawing. So again, if you're just uh, joining us online, check in, just put your name in the chat, let us know you're there. Feel free if you are um, if you're um, looking for a way to give, you can give online, you can give uh, also in the receptacle in the back of the um, auditorium as well. I don't know if somebody's in the foyer, but I think we got somebody that's coming in right now. I saw her trying the doors, so somebody can make sure that she gets in. That would be awesome. Thanks. Appreciate that, Pastor Phil. He's on it. All right. Um, I recently uh, heard someone describe the last several weeks, and actually the last couple of months, uh, they used a term that I thought was really descriptive of where we've been at as a culture. They used the phrase that we have been experiencing a cultural riot. And I thought, man, that is really descriptive of some of the things that we've been experiencing. Now, certainly, we've experienced some literal riots. But beyond all that, culturally, it's like there's a riot taking place. Um, and in particular, one of the ways that it, that has expressed itself is in what is known as uh, cancel culture. Have you ever heard this term, cancel culture? Uh, it's something that over the last few years has gained some momentum and some popularity as a, as a practice. Cancel culture, I came, up with a, I came across a definition. It's the practice of withdrawing support for public figures or companies after they do something deemed offensive. Now, if you know anything about cancel culture, you know that this is perhaps a nice way of putting it because cancel culture is actually usually very harsh. It's over the top and it's completely unforgiving. Uh, it, it, is a, it is an expression. It is a way of saying, look, you did something wrong. And sometimes, oftentimes, the, the people or the organizations involved have done something wrong. But normally what it is, is you've done something wrong and we're just going to cancel you and we're going to pretend like you don't exist. We're going to put you in the corner and we're done with you. Um, and it, it is, we see this all over the place. I think early on with the coronavirus, uh, there was kind of a call to cancel China. <laughs> like, thank you, China, for starting this um, or allowing this to come out, this coronavirus to come out. Um, I think after we had been in this and we have been in the shelter in place and all that, there was a call to cancel the quarantines. Um, you know, we live in a robust uh, political environment right now. That's one way of putting it, right? Uh, and so there's all sorts of calls to cancel politicians. Just cancel them. We're done with them. Um, you know, of course, uh, even tragically with some of the injustice that we've seen, um, some of the responses to the injustice we've seen the last couple of weeks has been to cancel things like cancel the police, um, defund the police, and it's kind of this knee-jerk reaction and just we're done with you. Um, and, and kind of following that, uh, I don't know if you had heard, but Gone with the Wind was pulled from an online provider, a video streaming service. Uh, cancel Gone with the Wind. Uh, more recently, cancel Aunt Jemima and I think Uncle Ben's Rice as well. Uh, a week or so ago, J.K. Rowling, uh, the author of the Harry Potter series, made some public statements and now everybody's wanting to cancel her. Um, I even saw some calls, calls to cancel Paw Patrol, which is, I guess, a cartoon with a dog that is a policeman or something. So some of this stuff is silly, and it's ridiculous, or at least it seems that way uh, to, uh, to, to maybe some of so Maybe some of this isn't ridiculous to some of you, but maybe some of it is. And, you know, how do we respond to this kind of cultural riot that's going on, this chaos that just kind of seems to be getting like spiraling out of control. How do we respond to that, you know, as Christians? Should we worry about being canceled ourselves because of our faith? Because we know that people in our culture are not, you know, they're not so excited about Christians. So should we, how do we respond if we get canceled or when we're canceled? Uh, how should we respond when other people are canceling something? Should we jump on the bandwagon? You know, when I was studying for uh, the message today, I realized that cancel culture isn't anything new. 
Um, we see it in our text today. Now, they didn't call it cancel culture in the first century, and they didn't have online you know, social media, and they didn't have hashtags and a marketing presence and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean that people fundamentally uh, react in some of the same ways that we do today. They did, it, they did it in the first century in many of the same ways that we do today. We're in a series of messages called Jesus Is. We're looking at Matthew chapters 11 and 12 in this series. And throughout these chapters, there's a variety of ways that Jesus reveals who he is. And, and oftentimes, what he's doing is he's challenging the expectations of the people that he's in, interacting with. Uh, we've already seen that Jesus is worthy of trust in light of John the Baptist's doubts. And last week we saw that Jesus is ultimate. As great as John was, there is a greater one, and that's Jesus. And so today what we're going to see is we're going to see that Jesus is constant in a world of cancellations. Let's look at verse 16. Jesus starts, he's talking to the crowd, and he says, To what can I compare this generation. Remember, leading up to this in this chapter, we've already seen John's estimation of Jesus. Remember, John was trying to figure out, John, I'm, uh, Jesus, I'm kind of doubting you. I think you're the Messiah. I'm not sure. You're not really following my expectations. So we saw John's estimation of Jesus. And then last week, we saw Jesus's estimation of John. And now today, we're going to see the crowd or the people's estimation of both John and John. And Jesus. Now, when Jesus is saying this here, to what can I compare this generation, he's talking in general terms about the people of his day, uh, but it's important for us to remember that Jesus is not saying this generation as in us today. He's talking about the people then. Anytime we look at the scriptures, the first step of understanding the scriptures is understanding what it meant. And when we understand what it meant, that gives us the grounding to be able to then apply it to us today. So we want to discover what is Jesus talking about with the people of that day. And he goes on and he gives us this little a parable or this word picture that teaches us a story. It says this in verse, at the end of 16. What, what should I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others. Now sometimes when Jesus speaks about children... Oftentimes, he's saying it in a positive way. He says, you need to have the faith of a child at one point. At another point, he says, to enter the kingdom, you need to be like a child. But this is not one of those positive times. Jesus is not saying this in a positive way. He's really critiquing the people, and he's saying it in a negative sense. He says they're like children in a marketplace. Now, when we think of a marketplace, we might think of a store like Schnucks or Walmart. And certainly the marketplace would be a place where people could buy and sell goods. Uh, but it was much more than that. The marketplace is where you would go to hear the news. Perhaps uh, one of the people in the town or village had a, had, a, had a family member that had come in from another town or village. And so you went to the marketplace to hear what was going on in the areas around you. Uh, the marketplace was also a place where you would, um, you would find work and find workers. So if you had a field and it was harvest time and you needed someone to help you, you'd go to the marketplace. It was also a place where legal transactions took place. You know, so you can have this picture here of a marketplace where adults are, are doing adult things and then the kids are kind of left on their own. Has any, have you ever been in, I'm sure you have, been in a situation where you're in a public setting where the adults are adulting and the children are childrening? You know what I mean? Like, like I think of like in a church environment, when the adults are talking, you know, before all of this social distancing stuff, you know, the kids kind of just go wild while the parents all talk. Uh, sometimes we see that here at weddings at the church or funerals even, at a visitation. Um, and this is the kind of the scene. It's the scene where the adults are doing the thing and the kids are kind of being left to run wild. And while they're doing that, Jesus says they're calling out to each other. And then verse 17, this is what they call out. We played the pipe for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge. And you did not mourn. Now, the New Testament is written uh, mostly in Greek. There's a couple of phrases in Aramaic. But really, Jesus and his disciples spoke Aramaic. And so what some scholars have done with this little saying here on the screen, we played the dirge or the pipe and we, and, uh, we sang a dirge, what they've done is they've tried to uh, 
inter- they tried to translate that back into Aramaic. And when they do, they find that it has kind of a meter and a rhyme to it. It's kind of sing-songy. And so as I was uh, getting ready for this and as I read that, it made me think about Buddy the Elf in the movie Elf. And I know I talk about this movie uh, quite a bit. It's one of my favorite movies. But do you remember that scene in the movie where he gives the Christmas gram to his dad that he's never met? Remember, you know, they, they, there's a misunderstanding. He's like, you're my dad, but you didn't know I was born, right? So that's the, that's the tune that I imagine that this is being said in. We played the pipe for you, but you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn, right? So if you've never seen that movie, you're like, this guy is crazy. But just trust me, it's a very funny scene in the movie. For those of you that have seen it, you can maybe hopefully appreciate that a little bit. But anyway, the idea is there's like this sing-songy calling out. It's almost like a taunt, I think, or a chant that's going back and forth with these kids. The image here is a group of spoiled children who are complaining about the options that they've been given to engage in. And if you're a parent and you've been parenting through uh, this pandemic, uh, then you know the pain that we're talking about here. When your child, it's like the middle of the afternoon and they've literally, they've, they've sunk into the couch where they've sat for the last several hours and you just say, get up and do something. And they're like, I don't know what to do. And so you're like, okay. And then you give them like five or six amazing ideas. And they're like, I don't want to do any of that. That's, that's, that's just boring. It's dumb. What's more, what can't be more boring than the fact that you've just like sunk into the couch there. But nonetheless, you understand this pain. This is what's going on with these kids. Now, in the examples that Jesus gives, there's only two options. It's let's play a happy game or let's play a sad game. And they're at, they're at polar ends uh, of one another. You can al- it's almost like they're saying, let's play a wedding game or let's play a funeral game. And even though there are only two options, the idea is, the sense of it is, is that the whole range of things in between, they're just like, nope. Nope, we don't want to do any of that. We're not going to engage. We're not going to, I'm just going to sit here on the couch. And I, it's the image of an irrational, spoiled, difficult child that's refusing to engage in anything. Now, this is the picture that Jesus gives a comparison of. He says, this, that's what this generation is like. Now, it's not exactly like our modern cancel culture, but it's, it's got some similarities to it. Because these, these children are just saying, look, I'm canceling you. I'm canceling your game. I don't want anything to do with you. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to do it my way. I'm not even going to interact with you at all. So what Jesus does next, he's given us this parable. Now he clarifies the meaning. This is what he's talking about. He says this in verses 18 and 19. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So just like mourning and dancing are at the polar ends of the spectrum, in many ways, Jesus and John, the way they approached their ministry, were at polar ends of the spectrum as well. So let's take a look at what they said about John. They said, John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. Now, in Matthew chapter 3, when we were introduced to John, we found out a bunch of different stuff about him. One of the things that we found out in verse 4 was that John ate locust and wild honey. Now, wild honey kind of might seem uh, appealing. I just had some tea in between service, and I put some honey in it. Like, I like honey. Wild honey, I'm sure that would be great. But the locust part, I'm not so sure about. The point is, his diet stands out because it was a pious diet, but it also was a diet that was uh, based on surviving off the land. And it was something that you would barely exist off of. So John was kind of eccentric in the way he ate, but that wasn't it. We saw last week, we talked about this, that John's whole lifestyle was extreme. Not only did he eat very little, he often fasted. He lived out in the wilderness alone. He was kind of viewed as a loner. He preached a very hard message of judgment. And because of all of this, the people, they didn't like what he was saying. They didn't like the way he lived. And they said, you know what? He's a madman. He's demon-possessed. And they just, they just pushed him in the corner. They canceled him. And they said, that's who he is. And you can see that while John is extreme, none of these descriptions of John really get to the point of someone who's demon-possessed. This is really an, an accurate description of John, and it's unnecessarily harsh. It's a poor excuse that's wrapped in an embellished description of who John, John was. So if they said that about John, what did they say about Jesus? Well, what they say about Jesus, I think, is actually even worse. It, they, it says this, The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, 
a friend of tax collect collectors and sinners. So they didn't like John's way of life, where he separated himself from society, but they also didn't like Jesus' approach, where Jesus got close to society. Jesus ate with sinners, and he reached out to them. I mean, he healed people that were Jewish, yeah, but he also healed Gentile people. Can you believe it? That's what their reaction was. He taught by his own authority. He seemed to be one who would, who would take the law and then speak with authority about it. Who is this guy? But instead of accepting him, what they ended up doing was they rejected him, and they did strongly. Now, if you notice here, there's quotation marks around the last part of the sentence. That's because uh, there, this is a quotation from the Old Testament, specifically the law in Deuteronomy chapter 21. In Deuteronomy chapter 21, God gave his people instructions for what to do with rebellious children. It's Father's Day. Uh, I don't know that we want to institute this, dads, but, you know, you can listen and maybe get some ideas or, or not. Deuteronomy 21, 20 says this, They're to bring them to the elders, and they shall say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Did you notice that that's the same language that the people were using about Jesus? So they're, they're, they're referring to Jesus as though he is a rebellious and a stubborn son. But look at the punishment that happens in verse 21. Then all the men of his town are to stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. So please, dads, let's not practice stoning today. Hopefully you know that, but let me just be clear about that. Let's not do that. But here's what he says. It says that they are to stone him. Why? Because they need to purge the evil from among them. So in other words, the people were accusing Jesus of leading them astray and being evil and being a problem in their society. And they were suggesting that, hey, there's a way we deal with people like this. And certainly as we read through the rest of Matthew's gospel, we'll see that these calls to react to Jesus become stronger and stronger and more negative along the way. The bottom line is this. The people would not repent with John and they would not rejoice with Jesus. They would not repent with John and they would not rejoice with Jesus. They were canceling them all. I came across this great quote from a scholar who kind of uh, puts Jesus' words just a bit differently, but I think it's a very helpful way for us to understand what Jesus is driving at here. Jesus says this. But all you do is to give orders and criticize. For the Baptist, for you, the Baptist is a madman because he fasts. Well, you want to make merry. Me, Jesus, you reproach because I eat with publicans, while you insist on strict separation from sinners. You hate the preaching of repentance, and you hate the proclamation of the gospel. So you play your childish games with God's messengers while Rome burns. You see, church, right now we are in the middle of a cultural riot. And the world is burning, isn't it? I mean, we've got coronavirus that's going on. I, I just watched a video this morning from one of our national directors, um, Greg Mundus, who had coronavirus. Many of you were praying for him. And um, he was, he, I, I didn't realize all the particulars, but he was in a coma for 30 days from coronavirus. And he's just now home. He's actually still on outpatient stuff. And it's been months that his recovery has taken place. Um, a friend of mine, um, who I think she's like in her late 20s, early 30s, she just got coronavirus uh, in the last, uh, last week. I think, it's, I think she hasn't seen her, her son for like seven days now because she's in quarantine. So we've got like, like the world has got all these issues. And everybody has an opinion about coronavirus, don't they? You know, we all want to paint people into their different corners and their different, you know, we have a toxic political environment that goes along with that. We've got these social justice issues and all of these problems seem to be mounting, but it just, doesn't it seem like sometimes people are just playing childish games while the world falls apart and we just become more and more divided? Nobody wants to work with each other. They just want to cancel each other. And if we aren't, if we aren't careful, church, we end up falling into that same mindset. So how do we respond? So I want to give us like two kind of big ideas of how we respond. The first, um, we need to consider the, the context of our passage. Uh, we talked about that at the beginning. Jesus is talking about this generation, meaning the people of his day. But who is he talking to in, in, in particular? Who is Jesus referring to? Is he talking about just everybody that was alive in his day? Well, maybe in a general sense. But more specifically, he and John, their ministry was to the Jewish people. It was to God's people first. Now, Jesus did minister to others, so it does have some broader appeal. But because Jesus was speaking about the religious people of the day, I think what we need to do today is we need to take this message to heart for ourselves first. Because essentially, Jesus is not just talking to, but he's talking about those religious people. And he's saying, look, religious, religious people, you're playing games. 
Rome is on fire, and you're arguing about the technique that John and I are using. The primary application of this text is for us to look at our own relationship with Jesus. We need to make sure that we're not being dismissive of Jesus or we're not canceling him or canceling parts of what he's calling us to do. And we're going to look at this more closely next week because Jesus has some pretty harsh things to say. In fact, uh, up until this point, um, you may think that Jesus is always super nice. Um, but Jesus has a side where he can critique and he can judge and he can give clarity. And we're going to see that next week. But this is the question um, that I want us to consider today as it relates to us and our relationship with Jesus. In what ways are you potentially canceling Jesus? Now, I know some of you are like, hey, I showed up to church today, so I'm not canceling Jesus, Pastor Eric. (laughs) And I appreciate that you're here. But it's one thing to show up. It's another thing to allow him to really speak to our hearts and then be changed by it, isn't it? Um, are you really submitting to his leadership? When you read the scriptures, do you just read the parts that make you feel good and that you like? Or are you really reading the other parts too? Maybe there are some spots that are hard to understand. Are you really trying to understand that? You know, I, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm saying is, you know, look, the people of this generation that Jesus was talking about, they thought they were right. And Jesus had a, a harsh reality for them. Like, you're not as right as you think you are. And church, let me just say, I think sometimes we get in this mindset where we're like, well, I'm right, and I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I know what Jesus says about my life, and I know, but do you, are you allowing him to really speak to you and to correct the things that you know that, that, well, correct the things that you really know you should change, but you aren't because you're canceling him in that area? Does that make sense? I think sometimes, church, some of us who've been in the church our whole lives, I, I think I think for some of us, we need to unlearn some things so that we can relearn the way of Jesus and the, the, the words of Jesus again. Um, sometimes what happens for a lot of people when they've been in the church for a long time is we get, we get into a rut of the way things should be done. We get really, we get really focused on the methods. And we don't want to change the message. The core of the message stays the same. But sometimes we focus on the methods, and, and, we, and we don't realize that, that Jesus may want to cancel some of those things. He has the right to do that. Are we holding on to those or not? And then maybe you're someone who's newer to the church. Maybe you've uh, entered into a relationship with Jesus more recently, or maybe you've spent a lot of time out in the world, and you have some ideas and some ideology and some, some concepts that you're bringing into your faith. Um, and, and maybe you just need to allow the Lord to speak to you on that, and you need to stop canceling out him out from those areas of your life. So that's the first question. The second area that I want to apply this to us, um, I think we can find in our text as well. So, and it answers this question, how do we live in, in a cancel culture? You know, if we get canceled, do we just cancel right back? Well, you want to say that about me? Well, then I'll forget you, right? Is that how we react? Or maybe when uh, the world is canceling things, do we just pile on? And join the mob, how do we respond? A couple things. First, Jesus ends our text by giving us some really helpful perspective in all of this in our society today. It says this in verse 19. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. So oftentimes throughout the scripture, wisdom is personified. And oftentimes uh, wisdom is, is personified in the way of being a woman. And we see this in Proverbs, in Luke's gospel, Luke has this same interaction that Jesus has, but he changes the word a little bit. Jesus presumably said this on multiple occasions in multiple ways, but Luke puts it, but wisdom is uh, proved uh, right by her children. And so this idea of that there's works or there's children, there's something that's being produced uh, by wisdom. We might say the proof is in the pudding, which always struck me as a very strange saying, Uh, but uh, another thing we might say is that the truth will come out, right? We have this idea that, and that's what Jesus is saying. Uh, the wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Now, the way of Jesus is the way of wisdom. But, and that means that, you know, our path is not going to be easy. It's going to be a difficult path because it means that we're going to run counter to the world a, a lot of times. But as Jesus says here, he says that the results of that path may not be immediate. There's no promise here in this verse that the way of wisdom is immediately notified, noticed and understood by the people that you're living this out in front of. No, but instead, the idea here is that, look, you may reject me now. You may cancel me now, but I'm going to continue the path of wisdom, and at some point, it's going to be proven right. 
So I say all that to say that when we face this cancel culture where people just want to push people in corners and categorize them and just be done with them, the thing that you and I need to remember, church, we need to remember that Jesus endures. We need to remember that Jesus is constant. Jesus is enduring. He's still on the throne in the midst of the chaos and the upheaval in this cultural riot. When everything gets crazy, we have a tendency to worry. Then we, then we get involved and we try to fix it ourselves. We need to stop. We need to take a breath and remember, Jesus, you are on the throne. You are in control. And I'm going to walk the way of wisdom. And that's going to be proven right. That's what we are called to do first in the midst of this cancel culture. Second, remember how Jesus and John were talked about by the people? They said that John was a demon-possessed person and Jesus was a rebellious drunk. You know, uh, in, in many ways, what they were doing is they were trying to shame them. And that's really what cult, uh, co- uh, cancel culture is all about. It's about shaming. It's about pointing out someone else's flaws. And it's about disgracing someone. Now, there are aspects of cancel culture where people have been called out, and rightly so, because they were doing terrible things. Okay? But the, the idea behind cancel culture, often, it's about holding a grudge, and not just holding a grudge, but then displaying that grudge for everybody to see. Look. Look how terrible this person is. I'm holding this grudge. And it, it, it's really connected with the idea of a lack of forgiveness. I heard someone say this week, we live in a culture that demands constant atonement but actively disdains the idea of forgiveness. So it's like, I'm going to cancel you, and there's no way back. You're done. I'm done with you completely. So how do we respond? Well, church, instead of showing disgrace for others, we really need to put grace on display. We need to give the grace to others that we would want them to give us. None of us are perfect. Some of you, uh, you you know, you think you're really close. We we could maybe talk about that a little bit. Uh, But the reality is, is none of us are perfect, and we all need and want grace. We all expect people to understand the nuances of what we're saying and our opinions. We need to give that to other people as well. We need to follow the golden rule. Do unto others as they would have them do unto you. Jesus, in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he talked about judging, and he says, do not judge, but he doesn't stop there. People like to quote that and stop there. Jesus says, don't judge, with a warning, because the standard you use to judge, that's the standard that's going to come back onto you. So the warning there is, if you're harsh with others, they're going to be harsh back to you. So church, not only do we need to remember that Jesus is on the throne and all this chaos that, that, that wisdom is going to be proven right and the way of Jesus is going to be proven right. Not only do we remember that, but church, we also have to give grace. Extend that to others. Offer forgiveness. Provide a path for reconciliation. The last area that I think is helpful for us to remember, and what strikes me about this passage, is the parable that Jesus gives with these kids that are calling out to each other. It's like there's a complete lack of engagement. Like, nope, I'm not going to play that. Nope, I don't want to do that. Nope. I don't want to talk to you. Nope, we're not going to play. No, we're, 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 there's no effort to try. There's no effort, effort to listen. And you know, in cancel culture today, so much of cancel culture is about more about being heard than actually hearing. It, it's more about my position and me shouting my position and how wrong your position is than it is about even trying to understand the other position. So today, uh, our response isn't to just shout the loudest or get the mob on our side. Instead of that, what we need to do is we need to listen deeply and we need to listen broadly. Have you ever been in a conversation with somebody and they're talking, or you're talking, and, and you're trying to explain your point, and you can see in their, in their eyes, they're not listening to you. They're creating their argument for how they're going to refute what you're saying right now. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, they aren't listening to you, and maybe you've been the one that's done that before. That is not uh, listening deeply. That's listening very shallow, shallowly. Shallowly? Is that how you say that? Sure, Nikki's my grammar person, and Nikki said sure. So shallowly is the word we're using there. But we need to, church, we need to listen deeply, to really listen. You know, uh, I want to give an example of this, kind of in the sense of some of the, uh, the, the, um, the racial issues and the tensions that we've been experiencing in our culture. You know, one of the things, you know, I spoke um, uh, two or three weeks ago on the topic of, of, of racism and looked at a passage with the Good Samaritan. And I, I just want you to know that my goal wasn't just to, like, talk and do a message and then just be done with it. I've really been trying to listen. So uh, I've been watching some documentaries and some movies. I've got a couple of books I'm working through. I've been in part of some different uh, uh, online video meetings where I'm just listening. I'm not, uh, 
I'm not like listening to someone talk and then I'm building an argument so then I can fire back and justify myself or our culture or whatever. I'm really, really trying to listen. So I want to listen deeply, but I also want to listen broadly. And what I mean by that is so many of us, what we end up doing is we end up only listening to the people that are, are, are in our own echo chamber. And I've really tried to listen uh, broadly beyond just the people that say all the things that I already agree with. Um, I, I've got a, at least one book that I'm reading, and then one of the documentaries I'm reading, um, I've had people make negative comments about it. Well, that's just biased trash, basically, is what they've said. Well, it may be, and there may be some aspects of it that I don't agree with. In fact, I can tell you on the documentary, there were certain parts where I was like, mm, that seems a little biased to me. But overall, I'll tell you what, there was benefit that I gained from watching it. I learned a lot. At the very least, I learned a little bit about the other person's perspective, and it humanized them a little bit. We have a tendency in our culture with, see, this is why I want to talk about this today, because we have a tendency in our culture when we, when we have these sides, like, I think this, and that person thinks that. What we end up doing is we end up creating this caricature of this person, and they become like this thing that doesn't really exist, and it's like impersonal. But when you stop and you actually listen deeply, and you listen broadly, you go, oh, that's a human being. And I don't agree with them, but man, you know what? I understand their position a little bit better. And church, we've got to be the kind of people in this culture that don't just shout, uh, you know, and looking for approval from all the people that already agree with us. That's what happens online oftentimes. But instead, we need to be the kind of people that kind of like, if you will, cross that line and sit down and listen and hear and understand and grow because that's what, <laughs> that's the kind of grace and goodness and kindness that Christ did for us. When we go to him and repent, he listens to us. <laughs> he, he understands. He didn't, he crossed the line for us, didn't he? He came to earth on our behalf and he dwelt among us so that he could understand, so that he could be with us, so he could show us a better way. And I'm not saying you need to cross that line so that you, you stay over there, but at least you can show them a different path. Church, we are called to do these things. I just want to leave us with a response of these three things. First, remember that Jesus endures. Remember that Jesus endures. I know some of us, we've been cooped up in our homes. Um, we've, like the coronavirus can be terrible, but the mental health stuff that happens because we've been cooped up and all the different things, that can be, you know, a, a, a terrible thing for us as well. I've met a lot of people that are just like mentally spent because of all this. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of everybody yelling and screaming, tear down this statue, cancel the police, cancel this, cancel Aunt Jemima, whatever it is, and it seems like it's just crazy in the middle of all of that church, stop, breathe, and remember Jesus endures. Jesus is on the throne. He's got it. It's under control, okay? That's the first step. And the second then is to give grace to those people. And we do that by listening, by listening deeply, by listening broadly, by not listening so that we can say, yeah, you said that, you're wrong, let me show you how. No, just stop and listen. And I think we will all be better, and I think our culture will be better for it. So if you're here, or if you're watching online, and if you're like, man, this, I've never thought about these kinds of things in this way, I just want to remind you, I want to, uh, I want to inform you that Jesus loves you, that Jesus did these things for us. Jesus endures, and he calls us into relationship with him, and he gives and he extends grace to us, e even though we've been wrong. We've all sinned. We've fallen short of his glory. We've all done our own thing, and many of us have said, Jesus, I want to cancel you. I'm going to, I'm going to live my own way. And for each of us that have done that, he offers grace to us. And he says, I'm going to forgive you. And the way we do that is by calling out to him. And so in a moment when we sing this song or if you're online, I want to encourage you just to say a prayer that says, God, I'm sorry for canceling you, but I, I, I want to create a new relationship with you. Would you forgive me of my sins? Uh, there's a button in the chat area that you can click if you want someone to pray for you and just let us know that you're making that decision. But church, let's be the kind of people that remember that Jesus endures Let's give grace to the people around us, and let's make sure that we listen. Let's pray. God, today, we want to be countercultural. God, in the midst of this cultural riot that we're living in, Lord, we want to be the kind of people that, be, that bring peace, that bring perspective, that bring hope. So, Father, I pray that you would help us to be able to uh, find uh, the, the, the clarity of thought and mind to remember that you endure that you are constant, that you remain, and we can trust in you. I pray that that would be uh, something that, that grounds us. 
But Lord, in addition to that, God, help us to be uh, mindful of the fact that we are talking about other human beings who are broken and they make mistakes. And help us not to get caught up in the cancel culture, but instead, let's help us, God, to give grace to those who need it because we certainly need it as well. And God, teach us to listen. Teach us to listen to the voices, uh, certainly your voice. But Lord, help us also to listen to the voices that are different than ours. Not so that we get caught up in them and we turn aside, but so that we can learn and grow, so that we can extend the grace that's necessary to the people around us. God, we want to make sure that we understand so that we can minister effectively. So help us to listen, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would just stand with me, I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in a song. And uh, I want to just encourage us uh, throughout the time of us singing the song, let's listen to the Holy Spirit. And, and maybe, church, there's something in your life that you have uh, canceled Jesus out of. I just want to ask you to take some time as we sing this song to invite him in and give him the opportunity to point that out so you can embrace him and you can walk as you're supposed to in full relationship with him. So would you worship with us? And worship team, would you lead us? Bones 
singing that song, I couldn't help but think I would much rather be known um, for saying what's right about God than what than saying what's wrong about somebody else. And I think when it comes to listening, church, if we don't listen, what we end up doing is we end up uh, just kind of shouting about how everybody's wrong. And um, let's let the breath in our lungs be about praising God and lifting up and declaring who He is first and foremost. And I, and I just think in the climate and the culture that we live in right now, I think the way we do that, one of the ways we do that is by listening, by hearing what other people are saying and understanding instead of just trying to shout them down. And so this week, may you go from this place, may you go throughout your week as someone who is remembering that Jesus endures, that in the midst of the chaos, you can be firmly rooted in him. Let's go this week giving grace, even to the people that it's difficult to give grace to, because we know that at times we're difficult to be given grace to. And, and let's go and let's listen. Let's make sure we hear, we understand, so that we are in a position to proclaim the name of Jesus and lift that name on high, amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Happy Father's Day. We'll see you on Wednesday for our worship and prayer time. I think in a couple weeks we'll be opening that up for people to come in. But in the meantime, we'll see you online. God bless. Have a great afternoon. Again, happy Father's Day, dads. Go ahead and put your name in for that drawing there. God bless.